How are you, Joe? Good with you. All right, I will. We got five. Go ahead and call this uh, meeting to order. Have the roll call, please. Mayor Davis. Here. Commissioner Hay. Here. Commissioner Hodges. Here. Commissioner Hoppick. Here. Commissioner Ryan. Here. Hi, if you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't believe we have any awards and proclamations today. We'd then like to proceed to Citizens Forum. If there is anyone who'd like to come to the podium to discuss something not on the agenda, please give your name and address to the city clerk, please. Or, or from the podium is fine, but yeah, okay. My name, my name is Lisa Graham, and I live at 1310 East North Street, Salina. Good afternoon, members of Salina uh, City Commission. My name is Lisa Graham. I am a longtime resident and citizen of Salina, Kansas. I was born and raised and have worked in Salina for decades. I am coming to you for aid in resolving an issue of unequal treatment by the Salina Police Chief Brad Nelson and the City Prosecutor Chris Trocek. While crimes were committed against me initially, I was charged and had to retain legal counsel. The charge against me was dropped upon my pro producing video footage of the actual incident. The video shows several individuals in violation of Kansas statutes, placing myself in apprehension of harm. I have requested that the individuals be charged, as was I, for the alleged crimes. Four months following the occurrence, I was set for court appearance. Shortly after the charges were dropped involving myself, I, was appro I approached Chief Nelson requesting that the people in the video be charged. His reply was, it's been too long. I believe Kansas statute provides one year for the filing of criminal charges for these individuals' actions. Instead of charging the individuals, Chief Nelson chose to rehash my previous convictions, of which I will always profess my innocence. I will never, I will never admit fault for those false charges and only wish there was video footage of those incidences. Police Chief Nelson states he has reviewed the video footage and continues to not charge the individuals. A public servant's duty is to the Constitution rather than an ideology and bad governing. I have provided each commissioner with records of the action in charge. I'm requesting per resolution, uh, resolution number 1774-63, the ethics policy of, of the city of Salina for the governing body of the, of the city to apply the ethics policy to resolve this conflict prior to the filing of any civil proceedings. The individuals have the same options I had of appearing with counsel to dispute the evidence or charges. I would like for the city to consider the ethical conflicts of interest that have arisen in relation to Chief Nelson's prospective duty. Per Section 2, Application and Purpose, and Section 4, General Ethical Principles, Section 11, Section 12, and, and Section 13. I seek no disciplinary action or consequences of violations for the city officer or employee, Chief Nelson, per Section 14 at this time. Since my return to Salina in 2014, 
I have met some outstanding police officers, which says something about the leader. The signs of an outstanding leadership appear primarily among the followers. Let this conflict be the beginning of consciousness. Conflict when mismanaged destroys. Unless truth is of value to mankind, the most defeat, deceitful, trivial thing can tip the scales to corruption. In resolution, we need not concentrate on what divides us, but utilize tools of fairness to end conflict and division. The individuals not only violated city and state statutes, but also the policies of the townhouse. The criminal actions and harassment have intensified to this day. If any commissioners or public employers have any questions on what I have furnished for your review, please do not hesitate to contact me. I have a, a brief review of uh, some of the things that occurred. Just for time, Reverend, I would like to keep this fairly short. Obviously, we're, we're not a judicial panel here, so right. if, if there's a request that the staff or us if, if you give us a general idea of what you'd like, that may be better than reading. It looks like two pages have typed. Yeah, a page and a half. Page and a half. Yeah. So if you like, I, I won't read it. Because you, you have uh, information that I provided, video footage and so forth. And, and your request of us, if you were to summarize, it would be to do what? To... Um, Speak with um, Chief Nelson about resolution of the of the matter. Okay, I'm just going to look at staff. Are, are, are you aware of the yes Ms. specific Ms. matter? Ms. Graham uh, provided all of us uh, documentation a couple weeks ago. I've personally reviewed it. I've gone over it with Chief Nelson, and I think uh, the incident that she's referring to was the subject of a complaint filed by a, a, a resident of the apartment complex and a witness that was forwarded to the prosecutor who chose not to prosecute. So that's one one matter. The I've also reviewed the information, the video, the written statements that Ms. Graham has provided with respect to her accusations about uh, other activities in, in uh, the apartment complex related to the discharge of fireworks. I've reviewed that with Chief Nelson. I don't, I, in all honesty, we don't have agreement in terms of what we saw in the video and Ms. Graham's characterization, which is the basis of, I think, Ms. Graham's frustration about the lack of uh, initiating charges against uh, other residents in the complex. Um, while she's indicated um, if she felt like fireworks were being fired at her and at her property, uh, it did not appear in the videos to us that that, that was the case. And, and there's a number of other things that are accusations that we're unable to substantiate. And so without additional uh, evidence or ability to uh, proceed, there really aren't charges that we feel can be filed. Okay, if I could ask the city attorney, um, are there certain remedies that you would suggest that Ms. Graham consider or any action that we should take or could take to further investigate this? I know of none offhand. Uh, Mr. Scrag and I had not uh, discussed, I was aware of the situation, but it, we had not discussed that aspect. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that would be. No, I'm not aware of any either. We, As I said, we've reviewed all the information that Ms. Graham's provided, but not able to conclude that it rises to the level of charges. Ms. Graham, have you discussed this with the City Attorney, not City Attorney, the uh, City Prosecutor. prosecutor. City Ms. Prosecutor, Trocek. thank you. I have not, um, not with Christina Trocek. Um, my attorney spoke with her. I attempted to speak with Ellen, Ellen Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, it's evident in the video that the, the artillery type fireworks were even hitting our complex. They re released their dogs, their biting dogs, on numerous occasions. I even spoke with um, Mrs. Hodges about that on the phone uh, and the shelter not willing to pick up the dogs or do anything with the dogs. But um, the, 
the things that they that they've done is evident on that on that video. If you turn up the sound, you can even hear the person in trying to incite a riot. She uh, she threatens my uh, she threatens me with bodily harm. She um, she's done she does several things on the video, and if you turn up the sound, you can actually hear her. Uh, do this. And you said that your attorney has spoke with the city prosecutor? Uh, yeah, actually, the, when, when we went to court, the prosecutor was planning to prosecute me, and he showed her the video, and then he told, he told me that if she still attempted to prosecute me, it was prosecutorial mis misconduct on her part. So she chose not to prosecute me. All right. And is this a situation where Mrs. Graham's speaking with the city prosecutor would be of any value? I, the, I can try I, to facilitate that and, and find out the prosecutor's awareness and their willingness to speak with Ms. Graham. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, we've been provided, I believe, all the videos that Ms. Graham has, has mentioned. I've listened to them at maximum volume. And, and the chief, other officers, myself didn't see the grounds for uh, charges being filed, but I can try to attempt to facilitate some conversation. All right, and Ms. Graham could just contact you, you yeah, through yeah, your she's office. She's contacted our office many times. Uh, okay. You're welcome to do so again. That be to your satisfaction. To at least get started. No, We're, it's it's the five it's, of us are not a judicial match, so we. we yeah, right. I'm hesitant for us to even begin to act like judge and jury because that's not our role. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I don't expect you to act as, like judge and jury. I just, the, resol the, res <laughs> the resolution number here gives you, a, 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 gives you an outline of how to deal with city employees. That, yep. Actually, the resolution Ms. Graham's referencing is your, your code of ethics as a governing body. It, it's not intended to apply to city employees, and I don't believe the references are applicable. Okay. But the five of us will adhere to them. <laughs> okay. okay. And I don't think, think? Any, I don't think any of the five of us would would argue that it, so, it sounds like a very um, contentious situation and it, it's too bad that that you know we're having to get to this point to try to resolve it. Um, so at any rate it's it's, 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 it's difficult actually to know gotten worse. They flattened my tires last this past week, so it's gotten worse. But anyway, I thank you for your time. Thank you for bringing the issue forward, and, and you'll meet with the city manager at some point. Thank you. Norman Randall, Salina. This is an, an yeah. in isolated incident in Saline County. This goes back over four or five years. I'm in a similar situation. I understand law enforcement has a tough job. We need to send law enforcement to more schooling how to conduct themselves during these operations. They're taking advantage of their position. This was in the newspaper and this was before Sheriff Kokonowski resigned. Him and Chief Nelson were in the paper. We ha and you got just some isolated law enforcement officers. Most of these guys are good guys. But once in a while, you get a bad apple. They've got the attitude, well, I've got a gun and a badge, and I can do what I want. And that was stated in the Salina Journal. So law enforcement needs to do a little more research and training how to conduct themselves with the public. In other words, they have to live within the perimeters. They also have to obey the laws. So it, it, it's a hard job for them guys. But it's not an in isolated incident. This has happened to me in this county. Mr. Mandel, just so I'm clear so I can follow up, who are you saying said that in the paper? Uh, Sheriff Kokonowski and Brad Nelson, the chief of police. They both said the same thing? It was in the article. Now... You'd have my my two, both copies of that newspaper are in the court for evidence, so they've got both of my copies and they won't return them to me. 
But it wasn't with the city police. But my point is, your chief of police, did he agree with Sheriff Kokanowski or not? But he is in the paper with both of them. Their picture is there. So well, they've got an attitude problem. Just because two people show up in the newspaper in the same article doesn't mean they share the same. And, and I'm not prepared to say that Sheriff Kokanowski took that attitude, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you in greater detail if you could provide me a date or a time or some lead as to where you're headed with this. This has been ongoing for four years. If you can point yeah, me okay. in the right direction, I'd be happy to try to follow up. It's, it's a complicated issue. I, I feel sorry for law enforcement guys. They're put in a p bad position. They don't know whether to go this way or that way. Well, as far as the, the edu I mean, your comments about the education are well taken, and, and certainly I'll look over to the chief who's not here today. Uh, but uh, certainly if, if he needs more resources in that area, that I think we can manage to provide that. As for a point, to make a badge and a gun with a the badge with a light number on it is not a license to kill. Could not agree with you more. Thank you. Anyone else? Any comments? Oh, I thought you were coming up. No, nope. all right. In case we have no public hearings and items scheduled for a certain time. We'll then move to the consent agenda. Item 6.1, approve the minutes of February 25th, 2019. <coughs> Item 6.2, approve resolution number 19-7681, appointing members to the Accessibility Advisory Board, Community Art and Design Advisory Committee, and Tree Advisory Board. Item 6.3, Excuse me. Approve resolution number 19-7680, authorizing the mayor to execute a vault closure agreement allowing for closure of an underground vault in the public right-of-way located at 144, 146, and 148 South Santa Fe Avenue with the Boyd E. Smith Trust. And item 6.4, award contract for the 2019 chip seal. Project number 90019 to Circle C Paving and Construction, LLC of Goddard, Kansas, and the amount of 130000 $649.05 with a $9,350.95 contingency. Thank you. Are there any items that any of the commissioners would like removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, is there any action to be taken on the consent agenda? Mayor Davis, I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, been moved and seconded. Any further comments? Okay. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries five to nothing. We can now move to administration, item 7.1. Item 7.1, resolution number 19-7683, authorizing the acceptance of a grant award from the federal Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program as a subgrantee of the state of Kansas <coughs> under the Kansas Governor's Grants Program for upgrade of the computer-aided dispatch, authorizing the use of 911 funds to assist in the funding for any remaining costs associated with the upgrade and approving an amendment to the city's current agreement with Tyler Technologies Incorporated for the CAD upgrade. Didn't see you sitting on the side there, Mr. Pruitt. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, Commissioners, uh, today we're here asking for a couple things. Uh, just give you a little bit of background. In 1991, the city and Sling County purchased computer-aided dispatch, and we also had records and correction software at that same time. In 2011, we upgraded that software off of what was then the AS400 to uh, a Microsoft platform. Since that time, the uh, Microsoft platform is no longer supported or going out on us at this time, and it's, we need to upgrade to, to a new uh, platform. Uh, there have been many changes to this software. The current mapping is that we have now is no longer supported. Our public works department uh, 
maintains maintains two uh, mapping databases to allow for GIS mapping to work. Uh, so uh, that that's a huge uh, huge issue all the time. We also uh, have fire run cards and EMS run cards. So when you are sent on a call, a medical call or a fire call, this run cards tells us who to recommend to go to that. And there are hundreds of these cards out there and upgrading this we will no longer have to keep that database uh, updated. Uh, it'll look at the fire station and make recommendation by the incident type and it's looking for the equipment in the fire station. And that that will uh, cut down on, on the errors and the, the maintenance of that. So through, uh, through our planning process, we identified through the uh, Salinas Lane County 911 Advisory Board that uh, upgrades were necessary in preparation for Next Gen 911. Well, we are at Next Gen 911, but our computer aided dispatch is not there. Um, so that was identified as, as a major problem. And again, earlier the mapping was, was mentioned as, as an issue and the CAD Enterprise computer aided dispatch new software called Enterprise has all these upgrades in here for us. So in 2017 we applied for the burn grant. At that time uh, the burn grant got froze by the federal government. So there were no grants awarded in 2017. In 2018 we turned around and we asked for the, the grant again and just in January of this year, that grant did come out, and we were awarded $73,830 or $380. $73,380. And so with that grant, we will be able to fund most of our CAD upgrade, and 911 funds will be used to uh, finish paying off that that award on, on that contract. In your blue sheet, uh, it says that the uh, contract with Tyler, who is no, Tyler purchased New World, so we're dealing with Tyler now, no longer New World. Uh, your blue sheet says $110,600. At 315 today, I got a phone call from Tyler because we've been negotiating with him on this price for several weeks now. And we were able to negotiate that down to $106,600. So with the grant of $73,380, will pick up uh, the funds that are in our 911 account. We'll be able to finish paying off that Tyler account. So we are asking for that the commission adopt resolution 19-7683 authorizing the grant acceptance for the federal burn grant, and we're also asking authorization to use 911 funds to assist for paying for the remainder of that, and authorization to for a contract with Tyler for 106,600. A lot of things in one blue sheet. Yeah, usually you don't get asked to not take money from someone, but uh, are there any, <laughs> <laughs> any questions from this side? I would just like to compliment you on your negotiating skills and <laughs> hope that we can put those to work on other projects. Um, and then actually my only question is this, after touring um, and getting an update from the fire department um, during our study session today, they have new software that they're converting to for that combines fire and EMS. And will this <coughs> interface? Yes, ma'am. that okay? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. Uh, we made sure that the Tyler contract included the interfaces of the image trend. Okay. Prior to that, we had an interface with Firehouse. Well, they no longer need that interface, so we traded that, that, that licensing around for that. Well, Mayor, commissioners, well, go ahead. You may be addressing the same thing I was going to. I was just addressing the terms of the resolution, which you certainly <laughs> no, may, no, if you, no. uh, as you may have noticed, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, there are two not to exceed numbers uh, presently in your resolution, and um, if Mr. Pruitt can double check me, but 
the quick math looked, looked as though in section one, the resolution currently refers to a not to exceed figure of $37,220 of use of 911 funds. Uh, section two refers to the cost not to exceed of $110,600 for the cost of the upgrade. Uh, with that reduction in uh, the negotiated cost, I would expect that you might wish to modify Section 2 to reflect the 106, six, uh, the 106600 dollars cost of the upgrade, which would then reduce the 911 funds needed uh, to $33,220, I believe. If yes, sir. That, that proves out to be a $4,000 difference in both cases. So I guess that's hopefully the, the correct numbers. But is there any is there any maintenance once this is installed is there any i mean is there yes sir there, there there's annual maintenance on that the annual maintenance is shared by the city and the county because the the contract is so huge it covers mobile computers it covers the fire department police department sheriff's department ems rural fire so it, it is a countywide and we split that out every year uh, because the corrections part of it, city doesn't utilize the correction software, so the actually the county pays the uh, brunt of the standard software maintenance agreement on an annual basis. This year was one hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars. So we're buying the software and sharing it with the county and the other entities. The the software is primary is used for us, but they do benefit. The, the other agencies benefit, but it's the city that is the primary uh, purchaser of this, and it's the 911 funds that uh, okay. pay that. I guess this relates to Commissioner Hodges' question then the 911 upgrade for the main and the secondary, this covers both of those to be taken care of. The, the grant, the yeah, the backup. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. When 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 we do when we do that upgrade, that will uh, those computers out there will receive that same upgrade. Okay. Is there anything here that would not be consistent with the anticipated upgrade to the countywide uh, communication system? No, say, say that again, the, sir? the anticipated upgrade to our countywide uh, emergency communication system uh, for the radio for the radio yeah. for the radio infrastructure is this um, no this, this has no bearing on that okay. we have a meeting with uh, with that company our, our uh, with with Tusa coming up on the like the 15th of this month to discuss the uh, RFP on that the bid process on that so these are just we'll be back <coughs> for so the, for these that. are standalone separate Yes, sir. Then. All right. Two different, two different things. Thank you. And just for educational reasons, what other um, things are paid out of the 9/11 fund? Out of out of the 911 fund, we pay uh, our monthly bills out of that. So we, for for us to answer 911, we have to own, we have to purchase software, which we lease from. Basically, we lease it from the state of Kansas, and we pay an annual annual fee of maintenance fees on that. But if anything breaks, they come in and replace. Uh, of course, the computer-aided dispatch uh, is out of there. Uh, mobile is paid out of there. Um, anything that deals with dispatch. So um, the 24-hour recorder, voice recorder, is paid out of that. Um, copy machine, because we send faxes requesting for phone traces for somebody that is missing or endangered so we can ping their phone and find out where they are. Um, backbone radio, if, if we have anything on the radio that, that uh, breaks on, on the back end of it, they come down and they work on that. So at our consoles, our workstations, those radios have problems. We're in the back room, those radios have problems. That is paid for out of there. So essentially we usually bring in $330,000 a year and our expenses are right around $330,000 a year. 
So we're expecting the state legislators to uh, raise those 911 fees. Uh, they're currently asking, I think, for up to a dollar and a nickel. Last I saw, it was reduced down to 83 cents. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any uh, questions or comments from the public? Hearing none, bring it back up to the commission. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve resolution number 19 7683. Is that we should, little, probably, little more we should probably note the modified numbers as well. Oh, okay. with the with yeah, with the modified amount of the one oh six six hundred for the uh, uh, upgrade cost. And in fact, that and, and the. Thirty-three with the added thirty-three two twenty for the city's expense. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor of resolution nineteen just seven six eight three with the correction, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to nothing. Item seven point two. Item 7.2, resolution number 19-7677, authorizing and providing for the removal and replacement of the North Ninth Street Bridge and authorizing the issuance of temporary notes and or general obligation bonds of the city to pay the cost thereof. Ms. Beck. Amy, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, thank you. Um, here, this is another project authorization. We had one last week, and you'll see me bring forward a few more next week. Um, but I just wanted to really quickly go over the, the process of what that is, just so you can get an overview of why I keep bringing these things to you. Um, as you recall, in the fall, we, we do approve a five-year um, CIP program. And these projects were all approved in that program. And then the next step from that is this project authorization. And this basically just says, yes, we're willing, we're really, really going forward with this. And we're also going to allow ourselves to issue uh, debt to finance mo these. Um, the next thing that will happen with these projects is uh, staff will go out for bid on them and they'll bring back an award, a, a, a request for a reward on these, these projects. And then after that, once the project's complete, We'll be back to you again to issue final debt on these. So there's, you'll see these projects over and over and over again. I just wanted to kind of, so you knew kind of where we were in the process for these projects. So this particular project was approved in on December 10th in the um, resolution 187643, which adopted the 2019 to 2023 capital improvement program. It included two million dollars for the <coughs> removal, replacement, and reconstruction of the North Ninth Street Bridge. This superstructure was recently downgraded from a six to a four on a non-point scale, and the bridge is now load, post, load posted at 20 tons. This particular project includes removal, replacement, and reconstruction of the bridge and all the related improvements, including but not limited to right-of-way acquisition, design, engineering, construction, consultant inspection, drainage improvements, and other related and necessary improvements. It is anticipated that we will issue temporary notes in the amount of $500,000 in the spring of 2019 to get the project started. The bids will probably go out in the fall and we'll start that, pro that project. And then in the spring of 2020, we'll issue the, the remainder of the, tw the temporary notes as construction begins and gets go going full swing. And once the project is complete, we'll go out for general obligation bonds. Those bonds will be paid back through the debt service fund and they'll be supported by property tax. Uh, this is consistent with the city to provide the highest quality of services consistent with govern governing body direction, available resources, and staff commitment to quality. So we have two options tonight. Adopt <coughs> resolution 197677, authorizing the design and construction of the North Ninth Street Bridge and authorizing the issuance of temporary notes and or general obligation bonds, or do not uh, um, adopt the resolution and direct us, give us further direction. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer, or if you need details, I have Mr. Stack here. <laughs> is, is this doing both sides of the bridge or was this just doing one side? One side. That's what I was thinking when we talked about it. Also, 
six to four on a nine point scale really doesn't mean anything to me. So could you elaborate on that? And at, at what point is the bridge downgraded where it can't even be used as an entrance into the, to the Salina? Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. It's an eight point scale for bridges. Um, basically when they're first opened and driven on, then they go right to a seven. So a seven is about as good as you can get on a bridge. And as they go age over time, um, four is when you start getting, um, having to load post it. And then three is when it gets to be more, more concerning, I guess, on the inspections. We inspect this one every year. And then I'm not sure Jim is two closure. We've had one in the city that we had to close. And I think it was a two. So it's, I don't know, it's the best way to, I mean, the eight point scale, it's kind of, it is kind of hard to, I'm not the bridge inspector, Kent Johnson on our staff is, but that's what, that's, I know enough to be dangerous on that part anyway. So is the other side of the bridge in better condition? Southbound's pretty new. It was okay. uh, redone in the mid 2000s. So it's interesting, I don't know why we waited on the northbound side, but I guess it must have been in better shape um, at the time. And so we got, you know, arguably, 15 more years out of it, I guess you'd say. So that's, that's a good thing, but it is nearing the end of its useful life. So really what, the, when the original design happened on the uh, southbound bridge, <clears throat> that the idea was to extend that over uh, to take care of this northbound bridge when the time arose where that would, where that would be necessary. So that's supposed to be a fairly similar design to the, to the southbound bridge. And so it's, it's just getting to be time to do that now. Oh, I would like to yeah. reiterate that a rating of four is definitely safe to use mm -hmm. still. It posted for 20 tons is the legal limit and it applies mainly to overloads. If a company were to apply for a permit or try to do an overload, they may also have to um, pay for additional cribbing just to ensure the safety of the bridge so that it doesn't get any further deteriorated. But it's a, it, it is a fully functioning bridge. It's safe for the public. We normally inspect them on a two-year cycle, and because this one is showing its age, we do inspect it once a year, but that is common practice for this type of bridge. But its its days are numbered, and that's why we're, it's in the cycle to get it replaced in the next year or two. Not to be funny, but if I'm driving behind a truck that's 45,000 pounds, I can still go across the bridge after yep. it. Yep. Okay. You should be confident that the bridge is still safe. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I guess my question kind of speaks to that, too, <laughs> if I could follow up on that in terms um, I don't know what a 20-pound or 20-ton load um, is, is equal to. Does that cover most semis or... Um, yeah, it's it's a lot more complicated than this. The straight tonnage. It depends on the number of axles and the distance between, distance the, axles between the axles. And the, right. Distance. Whether they're single tires or double tires, but all of the truckers know what that means. There's a whole table that goes with it, and if they exceed that, then they have to apply for a permit to use the bridge. Gotcha. Um, do we get very many permits to to use a bridge for an oversized load, or do I mean how do, we, how, do we, how do we how do we police that? I mean I. I I, I I don't know. I mean, yeah, the oversized load permit goes through the Kansas Department of Transportation, and so if somebody, we do get quite a. I just say quite a few, but we get three or four, maybe five, six a year, where we um, get a, a heavy load from somewhere in the state, and so they have to route that through KDOT and then through us to go over, and the county as well. Sling County has bridges that they have to you know, go over to get to Salina or to get into town from different places. So it's it's a routing type of approach. And look, this is the northbound bridge. So it's when somebody takes something out of Salina that's really heavy, then they would have to go a certain route. So we don't typically have had any issues with that with this bridge. But we do have that with other bridges in town where we have, we have to route them over different areas to make sure it's the height and the weight limit and the uh, turning radius and traffic signal poles and it's 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 a process and we are usually pretty involved uh, city clerk gets those from KDOT and then we route them through our process as well but we do have um, right now we have other options should we get a request like that the, of something needing to be transported out of Salina that we could accommodate mm -hmm. a 20 plus ton load. Maybe yeah be marooned in Salina correct absolutely okay. Okay. Uh, there, there are a lot of other options mm -hmm. okay um 
just uh, probably this, this may even go to the, the other side of the bridge that was replaced in the mid-2000s. Um, it's, it, it seems, and, and I'm relatively new to the, the whole bridge game, but it seems that we, we replace bridges. Do we ever um, do any kind of like um, preventative maintenance or shoring up so that we don't get to the point where we have to entirely remove it and, um, and, and start from scratch? Or, I mean, what's, what's the typical lifespan of a bridge and is there any way that you can extend it? We, um, it seems a lot of the bridges over time, uh, as there is, it's a, it's a balancing act. It does seem like loads and tra truck traffic has gotten, um, it's federal legislation tries to keep it to a certain level, but there are, there's always people trying to, uh, increase the load limits basically. And so you have, you know, a, a bridge that was built in the thirties or forties or fifties is not typically designed for as much for the loads of today and so a lot of times it's harder to rehab a bridge that's been around for quite a while that was built under different load characteristics or different design loads so, so it does happen but it's i mean there are you know you'll see some pretty impressive bridges that are uh over you know large rivers or in big cities that they they chose to rehab instead of totally rebuild but it's it's quite a process to do that and so typically in in the case of, of bridges in Kansas, they're not quite as long, not quite as extravagant, but um, they have to look at the subgrade and the, the the structure they're sitting on, and then the span, and then the waterway opening, and the flood characteristics, and so they take that into account when they decide, yeah, should we try to rehab the bridge or replace it? So those are the, the, it does happen that we have um, some bridges that the substrate substrate and the substructure are good enough to just uh, redeck them or. Uh, reutilize the girders that are there. This one is a concrete. Can't remember what kind of bridge this is actually, but it's it's harder to rehab. I can tell you that. Gotcha. But, and we would probably expect a better lifespan out of the the lanes, the, the southbound lanes, because they were constructed in the mid 2000s, as mm -hmm. opposed to something that might have been constructed in yep. the 50s or 60s. Because mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I know we're, we've got a Magnolia bridge replacement in our future at some point too. So I just didn't know if we ever had the option of the reinforcement or um, if that was ever a maintenance issue, if we could prevent it to right. get to this point. Yeah, and Dan did a good job of explaining it. Two things I would add are <coughs> that inspection schedule that they talked about is intended to be proactive in terms of repair and maintenance. And from a safety standpoint, as well as if, to be proactive and preventative. And then I assure you between me and Debbie, you were full replacements the last resort the, just from a financial uh, accountability standpoint but you have to take into account the engineering um, aspects of it and then i just have one question um for debbie i think okay it's a thank you question, not a, a dan question yes um, i just wanted to be clear we um, we derive our bonding authority because this is designated a, ma a main traffic way is that my understanding that correctly or Yes, that's part of our, our ordinance, which allows us to do issue bonds for this type of project. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Yes, sir. Yep. Norman Mantle, Salina, Kansas. Yeah. There are, there are exceptions to the rules on these permits. Unless they change the law, if it is a federal or state contract, I can haul 100,000 pounds on my semi gross because we did it. We got an exemption. So you're trying to tell the government what to do, and they ain't going to do it. Uh, same way with the railroad. Have you ever seen a military convoy come through this state? They don't come through Salina at 10 miles an hour. The Union Pacific has an understanding with the federal government. We will haul your military equipment and you will not make us do anything. We're going to do what we want. And the government says, yeah, we'll do it. I know the president, or used to know the president of Union Pacific. He says, we do pretty much what we want. That's, that's the way society is. So we're going to have to learn to accept that or you're going to have to go to the legislatures and get these laws changed. But yeah, 
We used to haul 100,000 pounds gross on a semi down the interstates, the highways, the two lane ones. We got an exemption because it's a federal contract. That's not right. So just to comment, just, it's, it's a complicated process. Thank you. Any other comments? Bring it back to the commission. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I move we approve resolution number 197677, authorizing and providing for the removal and replacement of the North 9th Street Bridge and authorizing the issuance of temporary notes and or general obligation bonds of the city to pay for the cost thereof. Second. All right, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor of resolution 19-7677, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to nothing. Item 7.3. Item 7.3, approved 2019 vehicles and equipment purchases. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> I brought the whole team with me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make two clarification or two changes on the, the paperwork you do have. On page seven of nine of the detailed list um, on the item for the road grader, we we unintentionally pulled down the low bid and the select the recommended bid was the second bid, which was the hundred and eighty two thousand six seventy nine. So that's page seven, the second item. The selected bid amount should be one eighty two six seventy nine. And your pages, does it not show 18450? The 182 is highlighted in like a green yellow. Yes, but on the bottom of that section where we put oh, selected bid, yeah. we pulled down the wrong amount. Gotcha. And I would note that the, the notes in that same spreadsheet provide the justification for the highlighted bidder and the amount of, that, that corresponds with the $182,000 amount. Yes as it does for all of the items. The other change is on the blue sheet um, with that change and some other miscalculations. The net savings is um, 143,460. It's just above the first table um, where the 145,960 net savings is on the blue sheet, the front page of the blue sheet, just above the, the first table. I'm sorry, and net savings was what again? 143,460. Debbie, does that number assume kind of the worst case scenario in outfitting the police vehicles? Yes, yes it does. So what we have tonight is uh, basically the presentation of uh, the vehicle bids that we have gone through. Um, this too is, was approved on December 10th through the sub-CIP, the 2019 sub-CIP. Um, in that action, we approved 37 items under vehicles and equipment for various departments in the, for a total budgeted amount of $2,392,500. Staff from Central Garage works with departments to compile detailed list of specifications based on the needs of the department. Those specifications are intended to be generic enough that any man manufacturer could meet them. However, in some cases, the particular need may or may not be available in a certain brand. For example, if a particular size alternator is needed to run some ancillary equipment on a truck, that particular size may not be available on a, a particular make or model of a vehicle. So there's some, in some cases, that our need doesn't always meet what's out there that to, to be bid on. Um, in the original uh, request, the police department had requested five vehicles be replaced on the sub-CIP. When, when the bids came in, those vehicles came in over budget. So we discussed with the police department kind of what our options were, um, and they volunteered to take one of those items off the list. However, in the meantime, um, one of the police vehicles was totaled as a result of the, the chase that we had here a couple weeks ago. Um, and since we had bids out on five vehicles already and we weren't going to take one of them, we're recommending that we go ahead and take all five of those bids and replace the vehicle that we have that got totaled. Um, we have, um, Nancy has looked into insurance proceeds on that. We're expected to um, get approximately between sixteen dollars and $20,000. The number's kind of a range because we weren't quite sure if they were going to replace the equipment <coughs> that was inside of the vehicle, but they have come back and said they're going to replace some of that equipment that, that's actually put into those police vehicles. So that number should be between sixteen dollars and $20,000 as, as far as what we get back from them. Um, staff solicited bids for 26 vehicles and equipment. 
three of those bids are scheduled later in March because as we did the bids, we found out that some of the um, types of vehicles, the, the pricing wasn't available to the dealers yet. So they requested that we push that bid off. We did that on three of the vehicles. Bids for the other 23 were open on February 8th. 12 of those bids came in under budget. Seven came in over budget. Two are under further review by staff and two are being recommended to be rejected. Of the 19 bids being recommended this evening, there's a total savings of $143,460 from what we originally budgeted. The first table shows a list of items that went over budget and why. So the police vehicles, um, not only were the, bit, the vehicles higher, but we have, with the, with the police vehicles, it was a little bit of a different situation. Because the model changed, they're not sure if the equipment that's in the old, typically what we would do is take the equipment out of the old vehicle and we put it in the new vehicle and the cost is a lot lower for us. But because the model changed, they're not sure if that, be, that equipment's gonna fit in there properly, so they bid us two, two amounts. So that's why there's some ranges in here. Um, the rotary mower came in over or came in over budget. It's just um, just under bid, I think. The two mowers, there was a cost increase from the time of, that we got it. So the net over amount, where you see the the net over amount is thirty one to fifty one thousand. That's taking into account that equipment replacement variation. So we can, could come in either $31,000 over budget or $51,000 depending on what happens with that equipment. The next set of table is um, bids that did not go to the lowest bidder due, due to specification variances that are primarily um, primary to the utilization of the products not being met by the lowest bidder. Um, as you can see there's several items there. Uh, a lot, some of those were HP ratings or zero term, I'm not gonna go through them all unless you have a specific question. I do have um, the folks from Central Garage here and, and the departments. There's two bids that we are pulled for lower, for a further review. Uh, one was both for, for parks, one was um, the lowest bid wasn't selected and we wanna do a, a further review on the specs to make sure that we're getting what we need. And then the, the sprayer, there's, we need to review those specs and we may be pushing that one off to 2020 because that one came in quite a bit over budget. Um, there were two bids that were totally rejected. One was for a five ton dump truck. That one came in way over budget and we decided to push that off till next year or ask for the department to request that. And then the mo there was a mower for parks that didn't meet the specifications. No, but none of the bids met the specifications. So we're gonna go out for a rebid on that one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, three, the bids for the three trucks that were was postponed um, will be in mid-March, so we'll be bringing that later. I also provided with this um, a detail of the bids that were received, and in, the, in this spreadsheet you'll have all the bids that were received, and in this box that Mike also showed you is any um, notes to why we selected that particular one. So if you had any questions on that. Um, the fiscal note, the total budget available for sub-CIP for the 26 vehicles and equipment is 1,559,500. The recommended bids totaled $979,246 plus $36,000 to $57,000 to outfit those five police uh, cars for a total of up to $1,037,040. Um, a, a substantial number of these items are be fu being funded out of special sales tax. So I also attached in your packet a revised budget summary um, for this fund, which included the, the uh, revised revenue estimates that we talked about last week in the study session, and also um, included the revised savings on these particular vehicles. Um, so options tonight is to approve the 2019 vehicles and equipment plan as recommended authorize staff to proceed with purchases and authorize the city manager to sign contracts with the selected vendors. You can approve the 2019 vehicles as recommended with any modifications that you'd like, or you can not approve them and give us um, some further direction as far as how, where you want us to take those. So at this time, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions unless they're technical. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, I don't think they're, te they're technical. Um, I think they're more, um, uh, finance related. Okay. I guess um, I just want to confirm what's going to be included in that $1,034,000 um, 
um, equipment, which of the items that we haven't bid yet, because I was just, I kind of, I went through and kind of added up the um, the things that we that aren't at least known mm -hmm. at this point, and it looked like that there was close to, you know, four hundred thousand dollars in outstanding um, vehicle um, costs still remaining, like about three hundred and seventy nine, and um, specifically like two hundred fifty thousand of that was for parks, so that seemed like a really big um, impact um, on that department, and is that something that we're just going to, I mean, we, can, can you, are, are the, the vehicles that are highlighted in green, are those the ones that we are going to be pushing to 2020 and the rest that we're going to? Um, on this on this particular sheet? Yes, on that particular mm -hmm. sheet. I, I'll I, I explain was, the color coding on this one. Yeah, well, and I, uh, the, I was yellow ones, to, yeah. the yellow ones on the sheet, and this is for the public, this is a list of the, of the sub-CIP that was approved in the 2019 budget process. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that we're recommending to go forward with. The ones in the green are the three items that were the bids are coming in, in later in March. So those are the three one-ton trucks. Um, the one in red is a bid rejected that we're going to resubmit. So it's kind of a pinky red color. Um, there's two in orange that those were the two that were pulled for further review. So the, the six foot uh, mower, do you have the same copy that I do? I don't, I don't think I have pink or orange. orange. Oh, well. Um, so, uh, so basically the six foot mower, and then also on these sheets that's detailed, the 10 foot mower and the sprayer are the two that are being pulled for further review. Um, the six foot mower and the five ton dump truck are the two bids that were rejected. The six foot mower is the one that we're going to go out for bid for bid again on. So the, the one ton, the five ton dump truck will pu will push on to next year if the if the department wants to resubmit that request. Okay, and the other one that was we were pushing off for sure until 2020. That wasn't the sprayer, was it? That no, was that was the okay. dump truck. Okay. The five ton dump truck. Okay. And was it was there one other one that was going to be um, pushed off until 2020 or no? Uh, not on this list. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I was just trying to kind of, um, so I was just trying to get my head around exactly where, um, uh, you know, what, what all on this list was going to ultimately um, get funded. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when you get a chance, I would love to see the updated spreadsheet that has the, okay. the, the so other So from this list, it. the items that are not, have not been bid, so are not included in any of this, are the minivan for the police department, okay. which is down about six right. or seven, right. Right. the laser scanner, right. and then the, there are several items right. in the utilities division that have not been bid. Right. Everything right. else at, has at least gotten a bid or with going through a process. There's one item on here that we brought a few weeks ago, the grapple truck. We're still working on that agreement okay. um, to see if we can get that pushed through. Everything else was within this package okay. and and is noted in this package. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Does that make sense? Um, and just in terms of taking a look at the, um, the sales tax fund, I'm looking at like 2017, we ended up with um, an 18, or I'm sorry, a 1.8 million dollar carryover. Yes. In 2018, we ended up with a 1.6 million dollar carryover, and now in 2019, we're looking at right around 700,000. That's carryover correct. Carryover in that balance, and I know our target balance is, um, you, as you noted, 750 thousand dollars. And since we um, we've reduced that by 1.2 million dollars, just like in the last couple of years, I just didn't know if that was um, any cause con for concern for staff because to me it seems like a pretty re big reduction um, in in that fund and I know that deliberately you want to get it spent to a lower amount but um, it seems like we're well underneath that amount and do well, we anticipate I, I, trying to build it back up to 750 in subsequent years? And definitely in terms of uh, hitting that target goal I think we discussed part of that in the, the budget process, recognizing there were some timing issues there where um, distributions hadn't occurred in years past, so we, it was kind of an intentional spend down. I can't remember uh, the item that, that contributed to that timing, but yeah, we are mindful of the target balance and the current balance and, 
And sub CIP is probably one of the biggest uh, opportunities to manage that fund balance going forward. And I will note too, if you if you notice that since 2017, typically our budgeted expenditures have come in well above what our actuals have come in at. And we would not expect that to be any different because the estimates that we're making now, is, you know, on vehicles, we're seeing $142,000 just in this group of items. There'll be those savings in other items. There might be items that we, like CIP planning, that we may not spend all of that funding. So some of that is going to give us that, allow us to do that. But the reason we're getting down below that is that we went back after our study session and said, okay, this is what we budgeted for 2019, a growth of 2.5%. What we're really seeing is about 1.5%. So let's be a really conservative and let's go for 1% and say, if we grew at 1%, this is what it's going to look like. Right, and, and you, you segued perfectly because that was my next question about where, um, where did that 1% come from? I mean, I know we had the 1.5% as you referenced last year. And I mean, what, what was, what was the... the um, the analysis. Conservatism. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the it really truly really went is. into um, it's settling truly, on one percent. Yeah, it truly is just being uber conservative in, in that number, so that we can make good decisions on these items that we have coming forward. So, for example, on the trucks that were over budget significantly, that what we're doing makes a big effect on how we address that item. In previous years, we would have probably just said, we've got it in the fund, let's just go for it. Right. You know, this year we're saying, we got to go back out and make sure that we're, we're ready to, to pay for an item like that. And, and then I guess I had to expand on that, recognizing that in light of the conversation we had in study session mm -hmm. a week ago, yeah. uh, our intent until we're able to get through the 2019 review is as we bring you spending items, whatever that revenue source is, to have this level of conversation about at least that particular revenue source as you're being asked to make financial decisions until we can kind of get all of the financial projections revisited and, and uh, reported and revised. So we're at least trying to be mindful as we bring you spending items as it relates to a particular revenue item that we go back, look at the more recent information we have, the trend, and then recalculate, re-estimate uh, 2019 year end in light of the purchase that you're being asked to consider. And I, I really, I for one really appreciate that. And yeah, anything that you can do to continue that analysis and mm -hmm. highlight that and the, the staff reports I, is, is very helpful for me. Um, I guess my, um, does, I guess that's kind of it. I would just, we had just, um, the Kansas Department of Revenue had just released um, uh, sales tax distributions for February, and I had a concern because I think that Salinas, and I know that we've never been able to quite get our um, Excel spreadsheets to match up, mm -hmm. but it showed um, that we were 6% down um, from February of 2018, kind of reflecting, you know, what consumers spent during the Christmas season. And um, I, I, I didn't know, are, are we kind of thinking ahead just in case um, you know, hopefully we'll get that 1% growth that, we, that we'd like to see, but um, I assume this is just going to be kind of an ongoing process um, to, to determine, like, where we're at and see where we can, you know, yes. uh, pull back some. And I, honestly, I, I got those numbers in this week, but I haven't had a chance to look at what, what our numbers kind right. of are comparing at. Yeah. Um, so I didn't see that particular number, but I, I can certainly look at it and see where, where we, what it's showing. Mm-hmm. I guess I got one. Are we required? I mean, we're not required. Do we don't have to take the lowest bid, right? Um, typically, that's our process is to take the lowest bid unless they don't meet our <clears throat> specifications. Because I was looking at page six uh, of the nine up there with the uh, half ton four by four crew cab. You know, you got Midway Motors at twenty four thousand five thirteen, and you got uh, Marshall Motors at twenty four five twenty seven, which is a fourteen dollar difference. And, you know, like I said, I, I think staying local means a lot. I mean, if with that little tiny bit of a, mm -hmm. I mean, if it was several thousand dollars difference, I would, or several hundred dollars difference, I would say different. But, you know, $14 just seems like that's a. Correct me. Is there a certain small percentage amount that is allowed 
Right. To stay local if it's... That approach is commonly referred to as a local preference and Salina has not adopted a local preference. We, By way of our purchasing policy, the expectation, as Debbie mentioned, is number one, that as we prepare bids and specifications that uh, it, it is kind of uh, generic, for lack of a better term, in terms of the specifications so that we aren't specking out a maker model. We also include language or a, equivalent, meaning that you know, it doesn't have to be exactly to those specifications. If a, if a bidder has something that's similar, then we have some discretion to uh, determine whether that's equivalent. And then we reserve the right to award bids that we deem to be in the best interest of the city and the organization. Having said that, um, the purchasing policy also then presumes that you're going to award the bid to the low bidder unless there is a justification provided based on you know the, the information about a particular item. So as we've brought forward to you uh, recommendations not to award the bid to the low bidder, we've tried to provide details about the equipment that's being bid and a justification of why it's in our best interest to um, make that purchase. But we don't have a history of uh, a equivalent equipment just being awarded locally on the assumption of a local preference. So I, I would be, I'd fully recognize that that is a very close bid. Um, and you, uh, the city attorney uh, may want to weigh in, but I think you have some discretion. But if you, if you really want to have a conversation about making decisions solely based on whether they're local or not, that's probably a policy decision that we really need to staff through. Um, it can become a slippery slope. I've been in other communities where we have enacted a local preference and we, it's resulted in competitive, historically competitive bidders no longer choosing to participate in the process and it can in, carries with it a cost in the In the extreme case of the bids run. having been exactly the same dollar for dollar. I'm sorry? If the bids had been the exact same amount down to the penny, what's the, your method for making a decision? I think uh, ultimately the governing body would have discretion there. I mean, at that point, if it, they're exactly equal, then you might have a reason to uh, justify having to make a choice between the two, and then their local uh, status might play in. I have a somewhat related question. Some of the lower lowest bids were not selected because of the specification variances. Right. At what point do you simply reject that bid and not list it so that it doesn't look like the lowest bid wasn't selected? Well, uh, we feel like we have an obligation to report all the, the bids received and then report the status of them so that, you know, if you're, if you as a governing body, the public that's, that's looking at the staff report or someone that's going back in time and looking at it, uh, our preference would be that the record indicates we received a bid. We reviewed the bid and deemed it to not meet the specifications for a specified reason rather than, uh, and, and so to your point, it, it may not be accurate to call them the lowest bidder because they didn't meet the specifications. Because um, in some of the other bids, uh, the staff's been very diligent re reporting, yes, we got this <coughs> bid, but it was basically rejected because they didn't meet right. our specifications. Yeah. So it may have been a low amount, but we weren't even going to consider it because they weren't bidding on what we needed. Right. Yeah, I think if you look back on other purchases where we're not working on sp from spreadsheets like we are with this one and, and it's more of a single item, you will see a table within the staff report that includes all the bids and then notes those that failed to meet the bid specifications for one reason or another. So there may be a better way to tabulate and communicate them, but I think we have an obligation to report all bids received and then note the status. So so for the vehicles, would they have been considered not meeting the bid specifications? Correct. If, yeah. if the low bid wasn't selected, in most cases, they did not meet those specifications. You, you have two things going on. You have uh, what, we're, what this report is calling a low bid that didn't meet the specifications, and we're trying to call that to your attention. And then we have low bids that uh, we're recommending uh, going with someone other than the low bidder for a particular reason. Um, and that may be that they don't meet the specifications. I think the, the example that occurs to me is uh, you have information about a uh, fuel consumption comparison between two vehicles and the cost recovery over time. Uh, they may have met the the letter of the low sp the specification, but staff's uh, done enough analysis to suggest that we might want to make a uh, a purchase from someone other than the low bidder for that reason. 
Okay, just saying, well, the way my mind thinks, it, if it really didn't meet the specifications, then no, I, it, right. it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be listed. Right. No, well, <laughs> I, I, and going, I understand your point. My suggestion would be that it probably needs to be listed, but it probably shouldn't be referred to as the lowest bidder. Lowest bidder. It should okay. be right. identified as non-responsive or not meeting bid right. specifications. Sounds good. Any questions? No questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm good where we are. All right. All right, commissioners, if I could, um, Ms. Pack uh, touched on it in her staff report, and I'm going to put uh, at least Jim Toich on the spot, maybe Ron Rouse as well, I don't know. Um, um, you've had some feedback about, you know, concern about our specifications eliminating uh, vendors and makes and models and that type of thing. And Jim, Jim and I have had a conversation, and he can speak in greater detail to the the process that they go through, the, the due diligence they apply as a staff, and, and I, frankly, in dealing with Jim and Ron Rouse, our fleet superintendent, I, I was startled by their level of knowledge on a, a box of bids and documentation and multiple uh, uh, submittals, and I think it'd be worthwhile to give them an opportunity to kind of speak to that issue a little bit. Mr. Mayor, commissioners. So, uh, first of all, I have to give all kudos to Ron Rouse, our fleet superintendent. He used to be our landfill superintendent, and when Bob Peck retired, he took over the role for Central Garage, and he's done absolutely stellar in that role. So, thanks very much to Ron. Um, so, when the uh, Ron, Ron, when Debbie does the, she says, okay, it's time to do the budget. Ron contacts all of the departments. All of the departments then prepare the vehicles that they see a need for replacement. Um, Central Garage works with each of those departments to help them write their specs. We do, first of all, we do not write specs based on a particular make and model of vehicle. We try to identify what is the requirement to do the task. And then uh, I actually meet with Ron and we go through the specifications line by line to say, why is this on the spec? How does this compare to the, um, the array of different makes and models that may be available uh, for that capability set that we're trying to purchase for? Um, and then we just make sure that the way that the spec is written, that as many bidders as possible can bid on that spec. Um, Ron helps the departments write their own specs, and, uh, and then it gets reviewed again, obviously, at the, the department level. Um, there are examples where there are simply um, some makes and models that, that a, a certain company cannot bid on because of a uh, that particular makes vehicle does not offer a certain feature that's required for the task. When when we build a service truck for um, for Martha and that requires equipment on it so that they can operate tools. Um, outside of the truck, so it has to have a power inverter on it. That power inverter requires an alternator to keep the electrical system on that truck uh, fully functioning. So in a case like that, we have to make a selection based on the capability that she needs. And, and that's often why we will say this, this vehicle may be... Um, you know, perfectly fine in a, in a general application, but in the specified application, it is not. And then most of the, the city vehicles, because we have service lights, we have the requirements, um, you know, for protection of the crews and protection of the public, that draws an additional electrical requirement. So we try to consider all of those things. Um, I don't know if I address uh, yeah, everything. I think so. The one that occurs to me is uh, ballistic panels for the uh, police uh, vehicles, and that's not to say the ballistic panels couldn't be added after market to another piece of equipment. But then you start to look at the, you know, the cost comparison of the bids received and the added cost for that that retrofit, and that starts to cause the low bidder to not be cost effective anymore in this particular case. I, 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 I would add that. Uh, right. Specifications are complicated. Writing them is, is a very detailed process, and, and the volume that they're dealing with, um, 
and you've got to start somewhere, but they tried to be mindful of making it as open to as many possible bidders within our identified Absolutely. needs as possible. I'll also tell you there's a, there's a whole separate section that we look at when we're doing these vehicles just to run it through the CIP system to, to look for ways that we can improve processes that we do. So this is the, requir the job requirement, but are there things that we can do to that vehicle to improve that process? There is a, uh, a very small fee to add a feature inside the sanitation truck where you flip a switch and the driver has to get out of the vehicle once and it will go through a sequence of his lights. So he doesn't have to climb into the truck, turn on his blinker, get out, go check the front and the back of the truck, then get back in, turn the other blinker on. This simple switch allows that whole thing to happen so he only has to get in and out of the vehicle one time. So we also run it through like an efficiency, from an efficiency standpoint, looking for ways that we can uh, do cost savings. Thank you, it's been yes, sir. actually quite educational. I think folks at home probably been asking the same questions that uh, we were. I'd still, I'd still like to see the maybe the governing body take a look at that. Like I said, go back to this, you know, the the pro, you know, you 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 shop local, and you try to buy local as, as much as possible. I still say fourteen dollars is not a, a deal to go. <coughs> we have we have a policy in place, correct? That we, we do not have a local preference policy. Right. I mean, we have a we policy would. of how we, and I think we discussed this a little bit last in our strategic planning last year. And, I, and again, I think that's another place you have to take it up because there are, whether I like it or not, there can be consequences if you don't take low bid, not, you know, not only here, but also for some of our vendors that go out to bid if they see that we're not taking a low bid, some of our current vendors in our community could be, you know, could be penalized too. So I think if we're going to do that, again, we need to take a look at it. And I, I do believe maybe the county has a, a different policy than we have. Am I, am I correct? I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, there's 1%. I think the county does have a 1%, yeah, so. And I think Commissioner Hoppe, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, did we have a discussion about that at building authority meeting? I think maybe mm -hmm. um, whether, in, because the building authority generally brings its policies uh, into compliance with the county. And we had kind of a brisk discussion about it at, at that meeting. And I think, you know, you can make a persuasive argument um, either way, but um, frankly, like Commissioner Hoppe said, there's a, a policy in place and uh, I think that's maybe a debate for another another time. I would tell you from staff, if you collectively as a governing body want to take up that topic, we stand ready to staff that through. But it is more complicated than it might first it appear. Is. It um, is. Yeah. And I guess, Commissioner, hey, my, my problem would be making that decision on one thing today, you know. Out of the ordinary, but I think if it is something that you know the governing body wishes to look at again staff can staff that through for us and and uh, Give us some examples of the pros and cons of doing that and then also and we have uh, a strategic planning meeting coming up We can always right. that'd be fine is, And right. that strategic planning meeting I realize we're we're wandering a field here, but that's um, April 15th Correct, Monday, April fifteenth, uh, and we are not I, having a. I don't a know much of anything off the top <laughs> of my head, but that sounds roughly <laughs> correct. Well, it was one, it was one of the things I meant to confirm, but there won't be since there won't be a commission meeting or study session yes, on uh, Monday, April fifteenth. Uh, yep, that looks right. like the correct date. Okay. All right. Is there action on item seven point three? Mayor comment. Davis, I'm, I'm sorry. Here. Let's do public comment. Okay. Come on down, Mr. Mann. <laughs> this happened with the county. <coughs> they went through this process. They were in a legal conundrum. The contractor filed a lawsuit. I think you can talk to the county commissioners. And they had to backtrack on their bidding process. So now they manipulated the process 
to favoritism to local bidders. Mr. Cheney out of Manhattan filed a lawsuit. He won his lawsuit. So be careful. It's just you're stepping over lines. You're violating state laws because the process, the bidding process, is to obtain the lowest bid for the benefit of the taxpayers. Whether it meets specifications or not, that might be an inconvenience. But that contract with the county, and I talked to Mr. Cheney, that contract almost cost the county 1,600,000 instead of 800 and some thousand. So look at this very carefully. Thanks. Well, Commissioners, I'm, I'm familiar with the matter that Mr. Mantle's referencing. It was prof for professional services and, and construction. Um, we've contracted in a similar scenario with that particular construction company. And, and so what staff has done for you as part of the staff report is provide you detail about our purchasing policy, provide you detail about the bids received and justification in any incidents where we're recommending the an award be awarded to anyone other than the low bidder, all for the purpose of providing you sufficient information to exercise your discretion. I, knowing what I know about the Cheney matter, it's not directly applicable to the decision that you have before you today. And it speaks to the wisdom of not changing our policy on the fly during a <laughs> particular item, uh, but discussing it at our strategic planning session. Any additional public comment. In that case, bring it back to the commission. Mayor Davis, I move that we approve the 2019 vehicles and equipment purchases as presented. Second. Okay. And that will include the corrected amount if we need to correct it. The one on page one, the hundred forty-five thousand. Yeah, savings. That, that's actually just a it's piece of data for you as part of the staff okay. report uh, in terms of savings. Excellent. All right, there's a second. Was there a second? Yes, I said. Okay, it. thank you. Moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five, nothing. Thank you. And it should be one more up top here 7.4. Item 7.4 award contract to paint the exterior of five slides at the Kenwood Cove Aquatic Park. Mr. Hammond, thank you. Mayor. Uh, commissioners, how are you today? Um, my name is Jeff Heyman, the Recreation Supervisor for Parks and Recreation. And I have the pleasure of running the uh, number one rated water park in the state of Kansas. <laughs> yes, it yes. is. Uh, this summer, <laughs> Kenwood Cove will be celebrating its 10th anniversary of operation for the city of Salina. Kenwood Cove is a highly visible amenity through the Kenwood and Oakdale Park area and is showing significant <coughs> fading on the exterior of the slides. Upon closer inspection of the fiberglass exteriors, you'll find chalking and alligator-like scale in certain areas. Uh, this occurs from heat from the sun and outdoor elements affecting the exterior fiberglass gel coat, causing it to degrade over a relatively short period of time. If the exterior is not maintained, it will eventually affect the interior riding surface and cause greater problems. Uh, the required maintenance for slide exteriors is recoating with a specialized paint or applying a new gel coat. Painting is the recommended solution over gel coat due to the similar lifespan and lower cost. Uh, slide resurface and repair companies suggest a lifespan of five years before recoating. And the slide manufacturer, which is Splash Tacular, uh, uh, states that they must that they see most of their slides needing recoating between seven and ten years. As I've stated, the slides at Kenwood Cove are approaching the 10-year mark. Uh, the interior riding surface of the slides gets maintained yearly, including safety inspections, waffing, uh, waxing and buffing, seam caulking, and minor chip repair from the recommended bidder. We seek the approval of the expense to provide, to protect the investment of the $1.5 million water slide portion of the city's investment in Kenwood Cove, uh, painting the exterior of the slides as part of that ongoing maintenance. Um, we have an inability to recommend the lower bid um, due to several concerns. Uh, we've had, at this time, we have not received the 5% bid bond from that low bidder. They did state it would be provided, 
However, it was a required part of the bid package. The low bidder has not shown experience in painting fiberglass slides from the references. The representative did verbally state they have painted slides previously. However, the reference provided did not back that up. The slide structure of Kenwood Cove is a difficult project due to the 65 feet of height and the access to the slides with proper reaching equipment. Uh, this fact will require the vendor to be highly experienced in reaching those heights and have specialized equipment to do so. There are a few areas where access to the exterior of the, exterior of the slides would be significantly difficult due to the physical constraints of the space around the slide structure. Uh, the low bidder did not inspect the area or investigate the scope of work required prior to bidding and did not show through references they are experienced in the type of work. Uh, the, also, the stated warranty of the bidder was three years, where the other bidders were five years. Uh, we had a second lowest bid um, from uh, eight block maintenance or slide pro, very similar to the recommended bidder. Very good references, have inspected the job site, have done a substantial amount of work to water slides uh, as a company. However, this bidder has not provided five years of maintenance services for our slides and, and is not, are not as familiar with the job site and the needs of access. The recommended bidder, uh, Dale Cooper LLC or Safe Slide, has provided excellent professional maintenance service for our slides for the previous five years, including safety inspections, waxing, buffing, polishing, seam caulking, chip repair. Uh, Parks and Recreation staff recommends this bidder to ensure the continuation of protecting the one and a half million dollar investment the city's made into Kenwood Cove. Uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions that you might have. I guess listen to the last two, you came well prepared. <laughs> I, I would say that Mr. Hammond's been very patient as he's been put through his paces on, the, on this question, and he's done quite a bit of preparation work with the, the bidders. Any questions from the commissioners? All right, thank you. Any comments from the public? Bring it back to the commission for action. Let's see. Uh, Mayor Davis, I move we accept the bid request from Dale Cooper LLC doing business as Safe Slide to paint the exterior of five Kenwood Cove slides. Second. Yeah. All right. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five nothing. We have no development business. Is there other business? Would you prefer to take the, I have a couple of items for other business. Would you prefer to deal with those prior to our executive prefer session? Prefer to take your items first. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think yeah. from the public's perspective, it'd probably be useful yeah. to do it before. Okay. Ann. Um, let's see, the first one, uh, we got crossed off the list, the strategic planning session set for Monday, April 15th. Um, the second was, I would just was wondering if I could have a confirmation of the um, status of the joint city-county uh, resolution concerning the tipping fees and annexation that we signed a few weeks ago. Um, I just wanted to confirm that that's all been finalized and, and, and adopted and, and, and we're good to go on that front. I'm going to defer to the city attorney in terms of the details related to the, to the legal aspects of that. Yes, happy to do that, and there are actually uh, a couple of developments that um, occurred as of today. The um, After you all had your joint meeting and considered the actual content of uh, the document, uh, working with uh, county councilor and county staff, we then proceeded to finalize. Uh, there were the exhibits, you might recall, that once we had the agreement as to what roads were affected and what was to occur there, uh, the balance of the exhibits uh, were completed to reflect uh, those descriptions that were in the content of the document. Uh, those were approved by both uh, staffs on the engineering side and uh, we then proceeded with, the next step of course was pursuing uh, approval uh, by Judge Elliott, uh, the district court judge who had been assigned to this case. Uh, that was submitted uh, 
Mr. Montoya and I developed a joint statement so that he would know and emphasize to the judge that, that the decision was made in a joint public meeting and explain to him what the, uh, the context was. Um, that was communicated to uh, Judge Elliott and uh, we got a reply from him actually yesterday uh, indicating that he had actually retired fully as a district court judge and uh, did not believe under those circumstances that he was authorized to sign off on the, you might recall we had the joint petition which was in satisfaction of the statutory requirements that had the agreement then attached to it and then a proposed order. Uh, those were both filed into the e-filing system and that's what was the basis of his receiving it along with the email that, uh, the joint email that Mr. Montoya and I submitted. Uh, Mr. Montoya, in response to the judge's indication of his <laughs> concern about his authority to sign off, uh, Mr. Montoya and I today uh, had conversation on how to advance the matter. Uh, Mr. Montoya, Judge Hickman was not available when Mr. Montoya and I were both available. So I, uh, and you wouldn't normally have a conversation, one lawyer with the judge and without both of us present, but under the circumstances and given the uh, consensual agreed upon uh, arrangement, uh, we expected that uh, the basis upon which Judge Hickman had originally felt the need to recuse himself might be eliminated since we were now in a uh, agreed upon uh, resolution. Uh, Mr. Montoya had that conversation and advised me uh, just not too long before coming down uh, for the meeting that uh, Judge Hickman was amenable to that and that he was initiating the process that would enable him to be reassigned to the case. Thought that that would take approximately a week. In the meantime, we will resubmit that order uh, that will now show Judge Hickman as the judge handling the matter and in place of Judge Elliott. So we anticipate that uh, we will give that opportunity to work through and then uh, that we expect it would be approximately a week and then we'll file that revised order that shows Judge, judge Hickman as the judge considering the order that would approve the agreement that would eliminate the injunction that we were uh, seeking to address through the agreement. So that uh, is the latest on that. So our court cases outlasted one judge's career. Yeah. <laughs> um, well. And this delay does not represent any revisions per se, it's a matter of um, getting a new judge assigned, waiting for that transfer to take place, and then having him approve the same documents and the same exhibits that we approved several weeks ago. Yes, the only thing I, I want to be sure, uh, when you all considered the matter, you had before you the text, of course, of the full document, and then you had the proposed motion and order, exhibits E and E1. Uh, what we were developing and making sure that both engineering staffs had reviewed and approved were the exhibits A through D and some sub-exhibits in there that that reflected the, de the text of the document in describing what it is that the city would uh, be receiving the underlying interest and pursuing annexation. It's, it's basically that set of drawings that reflected the content of the document itself, but certainly no modification of any of the text in, in any of that intervening and, and period. And engineering staff has supplied those exhibits and they've signed off on, on that. I mean, our package is ready to go. Oh, it's, it, yes, it, it is completed and, and filed. It, it, is on, okay. it is on file okay. with the district court. Okay. Uh, and we were able to, to uh, complete that last week. And in, in the exhibits that Mr. Bankson is referring to, don't alter the intent or right. you know, the agreed upon, initially agreed yeah. upon terms of that agreement. They just supplement it in terms of attachments. Gotcha. Now, so if it takes us a week to get the judge um, reassigned, reassigned to Judge Hickman, what, um, what's the timetable for get, having this all filed and, and completed and behind us? 
it is uh, it is the the joint petition uh, which sounds a little odd I realize but in that case of that specific statute that allows a post judgment uh, change or uh, essentially withdrawal of that injunction it requires a joint a verified joint petition that's why we had the unique situation of why the mayor and uh, the chairman of the county commission had to sign off on that petition that has been filed uh, with the agreement attached so that is ripe if you will for the order that the judge then signs that approves that uh, we filed the order that would have enabled Judge Elliott to sign off, but uh, as soon as we know that the process is completed by which Judge Hickman has been reassigned to the case, we'll immediately file a substitute order that will show Judge Hickman as the authorizing judge. So that, I mean, will be, as soon as we know from uh, Rita, uh, Judge Hickman's, on Judge Hickman's staff, that their process is finished, we will electronically file that order that just as soon as Judge Hickman would have opportunity to read the agreement and be sure that it meets his approval, uh, he should be able to sign off on the order or let us know why not. <laughs> so hopefully in the next few weeks. Oh, I, yeah, I would hope in the next 10 days. Uh, between the, I know uh, Mr. Montoy was advising uh, Rita of the court number of uh, the case number so she could get that process uh, underway uh, so yes depending on how long Judge Hickman wishes to consider the agreement will dictate it but we will have that order on file by a week from today I expect that would enable him to act as soon as he has opportunity thank you I appreciate the update especially since uh, Chairman Vidrickson is, is here today to get it to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So um, the last thing I just uh, there were a couple of items in the commission information memorandum that we had from Parks and Rec this week. And I'm kind of disappointed that um, that, that they left because one of the things Not that as disappointed as me you're going to put me on the spot here. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. It's an attaboy. It's an attaboy. Um, I just wanted to. Um, commend them and Great Plains Manufacturing on the partnership that they've established with um, uh, together in terms of some of the prairie rehabilitation and the <coughs> site work for both Lakewood and for Indian Rock. And I think it speaks very well to um, um, Great Plains and Kubota and um, Parks and Rec staff that they've, um, that they've come up with that agreement and hopefully it works very well for all parties concerned and I just wanted to thank uh, Great Plains. and. Um, just the final thing is parks tour scheduled. Are we still trying to get, <laughs> is, is, is our acceptance of the parks master plan still kind of predicated on getting a tour together? Yeah, I believe so. In fact, um, I'm trying to think who we had this conversation with, but executive staff has had a conversation about uh, the the more formal approach to accepting master plans in general, whether that be Broadway or, or the park master plan, but I know uh, conversations are underway through Holly in my office trying to identify a, t a time. My expectation would be there's a park tour. We walk you through kind of that, that prioritization exercise that we have. And at the point that you've had an opportunity to have a tour and get comfortable, not necessarily with the final prioritization, but at least it's representative of where we want to take it, then you're probably in a position to adopt that plan. And we might uh, adopt that with some caveats or some clarification of you know what that means and what next steps we might pursue thank you and then I've got a handful of things if you be willing to humor me I, I had some suggestions on topics that might be yes. worth <laughs> reporting out and and uh, I th think that's a good point so if I may I'll, I'll run you through a few things please do um, concrete at the field house they uh, reported quite some time ago that we were in conversations with the, the contractor and kind of had drafted a proposed approach we provided that to representatives of the contractor in January we've been playing phone tag up into this weekend uh, but we are I think we have a conversation scheduled for uh, this week and from my perspective we have a proposed approach on the table and hope to get their response uh, this week recognizing that is, is staff's proposed approach and ultimately uh, 
Uh, we'll get their feedback and bring it to you for your consideration shortly. Uh, downtown projects, the with the, the winter weather and the wet weather, without a doubt that that's impacted the hotel, the alley, and uh, the street work. I've reached out to um, representatives of uh, the master developer and, and uh, public works department. Got the same response for everyone. Acknowledgement that it has impacted their timeline, but no one's willing to concede that it, they can't make up that lost time between now and their specified target dates for each one of those projects. Um, status of the police training center and when construction will begin. I think I mentioned uh, last week that two items um, uh, are underway, one being um, phase one in, in report, which we have received as well as an appraisal. Um, in all honesty, I think I'm the hold up. I have not been able to staff that through at my level, but intend to do that shortly so that we can uh, take up those uh, discussions with you. And then uh, city county uh, progress on the expo agreement. Um, staff, uh, at the staff level, we've had conversations about um, the possible approach and language as it relates to uh, a extended lease and, and that format that we talked about in terms of uh, some uh, language that speaks to ongoing commensurate investment in the property going forward. Um, and then at the staff level as well, we've had conversations about revisiting um, options as it relates to the um, uh, rodeo arena. And you, uh, you uh, <laughs> when I say options, alternatives to try to identify any needs that, that remain and how they might be addressed. So we're not to the point of scheduling, uh, having a scheduled meeting between the two governing bodies, but staff is trying to work through those remaining items so that we can be prepared to report out to you in the near future. Thank you. I had a quick question. Um, you're, when you're talking about the field house, we're still just dealing with horizontal, no vertical cracks, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and part of the proposed approach is additional testing uh, to get more information and continue to verify that. We, we didn't want to do any what would be invasive testing that could have cosmetic or aesthetic impacts on the floor surface unless we had a kind of a broader agreement of we're going to test and then depending on what we find out here are the proposed approaches to a, a solution. So um, step number one would be additional testing to continue to confirm that very point. All right. Are we ready for it? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I move that the city commission recess into executive session for how many minutes, gentlemen? What do you need? Well, I don't know. 20. <laughs> Twenty. Recess into executive session for 20 minutes to discuss the potential acquisition of specific real estate, the identification of which would be contrary to the public interest based upon the need for the preliminary discussion of the acquisition of real property pursuant to KSA 75-4319B6. The open meeting will resume in this room at 6.03 p.m. Second. Wait, I did not add correctly. Six. Okay, help me out here. Six oh eight. Six oh forty three. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, well, I, we can make the math the glare easier. Here. Oh, eight. And give us two minutes for a restroom break I and like come back at six oh five. Six oh five. You want it twenty minutes, right? Right. Yep. All right. So, so we'll take two minutes to the restroom and then back. All right. Um, it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. You need to vote on that. All oh, in favor? Uh, <laughs> any aye. opposed? Thank you. All and right. we do not expect any public action. Okay. Um, okay. Ooh, not for me. 